I'm your host, Mary Drellisak. Jay Shadler is my guest today, a two-time Emmy Award-winning journalist, photographer, artist, and speaker. He spent three decades traveling the globe as a correspondent for ABC News, 2020, Good Morning America, National Geographic, and others. Three of those years were spent hitchhiking 20,000 miles across the back roads of America, telling the stories of people he met along the way. Welcome, Jay. Thanks for having me. Oh, we're so glad to have you here today. And what a treat it is. So tell me, what was the biggest thing that you learned about people during the times you were hitchhiking across America? That, to me, is like the greatest <laughs> of the brave. Like, the no, story. it's so interesting. I mean, it, it, I always say that it really changed the way I, I work, changed the way I live, uh, changed everything about me in so many respects. And it began, just so you know, it began, uh, I'd been reading uh, Walt Whitman, and I came across a couple of his opening lines from Song of the Open Road, and they go like this. A foot and lighthearted I take to the open road, healthy, free, the world before me, the long brown path before me, leading wherever I choose. Henceforth I ask not for good fortune. I myself am good fortune. Strong and content, I travel the open road. So those lines, which, as I say, came from the, the opening of Song of the Open Road, those lines suggested to me that maybe I should pursue something in storytelling with ABC News that would allow me to literally hit the road uh, and hitchhike. Could I do it? Could I hitchhike across the country and talking to people and telling the stories from the front seat? This was the first time I did it was 1996. Uh, not a lot of people hitchhiking, but we, we passed the story idea to, uh, to ABC. And I have to say, although they were reluctant at first, uh, both Diane Sawyer and Phyllis McGrady, the executive producer of, uh, of primetime, both got on the bandwagon with it and greenlit the project with the caveat that yes, Jay, you can go do this, but be aware that we may never air this. So off we went, and uh, Mary, the greatest, um, the greatest eye-opening part of the experience was how common, how similar we all are. The first time I hitchhiked, it was during uh, the O.J. Simpson trial. I mean, 24-7 coverage of an event, just like 24-7, infinitely t- uh, more aggressive now, but bottom line is that I would get out on the road and the headline stories of the news that day would literally take up like maybe a minute or so of the conversation, two minutes of the conversation, but very quickly, again and again and again, whoever was driving wanted to turn the the subject to their lives, their loves, uh, their losses, their regrets, joys and fears the real heart of a life. Those were the headlines that were mattering to people. And that was the conversation I was in, I would fall into again and again and again. And it was spectacular that way. The willingness, the friendliness, the openness I found on that road was reinstilled my faith, which was getting shaken at that time. This was in the aftermath, of, among other things, of the, the bombing in Oklahoma City. There was a tremendous amount of fear of domestic terrorism. but the, the, the feeling I got very powerfully was that most Americans are really quite open-hearted, willing to talk, wanting to talk, and need to talk. So uh, it, it changed so many different things for me. And it loosened me up as a storyteller a great deal. Because I, you know, uh, so many stories are sort of planned out. Well, this would be open the door and what's, what's going on in your life? 
which turned out to be, for me, the way I wanted to tell stories. That had a negative effect down the road with ABC, I suppose, and just because I became so enamored with hitchhiking that I wanted to do more of it. And uh, ABC, uh, I hitchhiked twice across the country. We did these two specials for them. Uh, but then they said, okay, enough is enough. But I wasn't quite through with that. And so uh, my, my very good friend and producer, Robert Campos, uh, we said, let's do, it, let's do it again and we'll find somebody who wants to, to air it. So we aired another series of hitchhiking adventures called Taillights. But at any rate, the, uh, the takeaway again and again was just how spectacularly uh, common all of the joys and fears are for all of us. And to know it is, uh, is palpable. So in really a trusting time for you. You had to trust every stranger that you met. You told a story about um, an older man that you met in the Southwest desert when you were hitchhiking. Yeah. Tell, tell us about that one. Yeah, so it's 110 degrees. We're out in the middle of absolutely nowhere, desert. Uh, and I'm, hitchhiking down a just a very thin narrow strip of road and no one's picking me up there aren't very few cars but suddenly a, a, an old van pulls up driven by an even older driver and he says he lives out here well i'm amazed i say you live out here and i was so curious i said is there any chance i could see where you live he says, sure come with me so we go further down the road and then off on a two track deeper into the desert out here in the middle of nowhere is an old blue school bus with a tarp as, as an awning. There's some weird uh, gas-powered uh, watering system for it. The whole place is surrounded by a collection of trash and treasures. And suddenly out from the door of the bus pops uh, his wife, smiling and laughing and uh, just thrilled uh, like I was her long-lost friend. And so it turns out that this couple, had been driving that bus in the desert years ago, and they got stuck. And they got stuck in the sand, they couldn't go forward, and they couldn't go back. So they said, this is home, let's make it home. And that's what they did. They lived by uh, picking up trash, picking up uh, discarded items, and selling them on the road as well. But uh, I always tell that story because it, for me, it kind of, uh, is illustrative of Joseph Campbell's uh, great line about let go of the life you had planned in order to accept the one that's waiting for it. Well, these people had done exactly that. They let go of the life they had figured out that they were going to be enjoying and accepted this new one. Now, that's not a life you or I would necessarily ever, ever choose, but it does illustrate the point. And then I, you know, just, just as an aside, I always kind of combine that with a story of a monarch, it's a much more sublime uh, explanation of this idea of letting go of the life you had live to accept the one that's waiting for you. You know, the monarch caterpillar. Uh, we just had one uh, come out of its chrysalis today. This is a creature that in the, is phenomenally interesting in so many respects. And, but in the late summer, you know, right about now, beginning of the fall, they climb up in the tall grasses, turn up, turn up into a jay, and, and slip into a, this shimmering chrysalis, a bag of liquid chemicals. And they dissolve everything. Everything they were is gone, except for this bag of chemicals. But in a few days, in a few days, out emerges this incredible creature with, uh, with wings and the ability to fly. So I always think about that as if you, if you want a little of that kind of magic in your life, try invoking the child that's still very much inside of you. The, the child that might have gone looking for a chrysalis in a meadow. The one that, um, the one that where curiosity trumps fear, where inertia is beaten back by enchantment, and where yesterday, Yesterday carries no more weight than a butterfly. It's still in you. You know, a lot of self-help gurus often talk about reimagining your life, reinventing your life. 
And I think that there's a lot of truth in that. But I also feel like rediscovering who you were may be equally important, if not more so. Because we know who we are, but we've forgotten. Or we know who we are, but it's been layered over. Distractions and life, a layer and layer and layer and layer. Uh, you're, you're in here. You've got to listen. And then you'll hear yourself. And that, that's always comforting because that person, that part of your soul is your true self. And it's always, to me, it, it's always filled with compassion for yourself. It's not this you know, critical beast that uh, is, uh, is always playing negative to, your, to yourself. So anyway, Very you know, good. That, that was a wandering conversation. But. I love that. Be kind to yourself. I love that the story of acceptance. Mm. you know evolution and evolving tell yeah. me how has your own life evolved oh haphazardly very haphazardly uh i don't know how it has evolved you know like most people it's it's uh fits and starts um parts of it have been seen gloriously smooth but like everybody else uh the path has been broken down and uh, shifted. And, uh, and I, I've always, I've come to believe, I didn't realize it at first, but I felt like I'm navigating some transition so poorly. I mentioned that earlier to you. That, uh, leaving, leaving ABC, for example, uh, I really felt amazingly adrift after I left broadcasting. And, uh, I always say that you know, tracking tigers was nearly as treacherous as losing my apparent purpose in life, which is what happened after I left, left broadcasting. So um, I have, in reflecting upon all of that, I have really come to believe that my life journey has shown me again and again that um, failure and mistakes and detours are part of the way we move forward. Uh, they're not black holes, they are windows. And so I've also come to believe that the borderline of places um, is where life really happens. I remember doing stories on the Ebola virus uh, in uh, the rainforest of Africa we were with the with the World Health Organization looking for the source of the Ebola outbreak there, up in the canopy of the trees. It was a very dangerous, it was a dangerous story in many respects. But looking back, it, I realized also that I felt more alive in that moment perhaps than I had uh, before or after. Uh, when we are confronted with the, the deepest and darkest parts of ourselves, we're also looking at the, the most sacred. What's the biggest challenge you faced and how did you get through it? Uh, I would say that uh, it's, a, it's a challenge I face every day and, and uh, I've dealt with depression uh, most of my life. And it became, it has ebbed and flowed but clinical depression has been part of my life for a long time. I think that in some respects, this is another example of where the darkness can also bring on light. I, I, I think that um, coping with depression, everything with the medications and, uh, and various treatments, have also in, given me a tremendous empathy for people's pain, people's weaknesses, people's vulnerabilities. Uh, I, I felt like as a reporter, I think that I was very, very adept at asking questions in part because I, I could truly empathize. I wasn't coming in with a list of questions that I had made up in my mind and listening to the person who's talking to me and, and hearing their vulnerabilities. You know, Brene Brown always talks about the significance and importance of vulnerability as a place that truly is the, the birthplace of inventions, of curiosity, and creativity. And so 
I, I do think that the depression, as hard as it's been in many respects, it's also uh, led me to a connection with people. And that's one of the things that I, I focus on in the, in the keynote uh, on transitions in life. You know, it's, once again, it's really helpful to understand that your life, you're like everybody else. You know, I, there, there was a great line by, uh, by uh, a Sri Lankan monk named Bhante G. And I'm not sure I've got the quote down exactly, but the idea is that somewhere in this process, you're going to come to the sudden and shocking realization that your, your mind is a shrieking madhouse on wheels, barreling pell-mell down the hill, uh, totally and utterly out of control. That's the way it feels, right? Then the next line, he says, no problem, no problem, because it's always been that way, and you're like everybody else. Whenever you can say, I'm like you, a connection is made. We're all connected, absolutely. Let me ask you this. How, what was the biggest thing you've learned about yourself through your evolution? Well, I, I, you know, um, what is the biggest thing? I've learned? I, I think one of the, the major things that I've learned about myself is the need to stop clinging to ego. Ego is and has been a problem for me and uh, that is for most people I expect in many respects and public being in a leading a public life on television uh that almost inherently comes along with uh, a, a blown up ego of one sort or another and it was something that I had to um I had to deal with but I, it has been something that I've become more and more aware of and I as a result of that I think I'm I'm much less uh, egocentric than I ever was, simply because I, I've, I've been had put in my place on more occasions than I care to remember. But then, I, of course, I remember most of them. But that's a good thing. So the ego is, the ego is a, a problem in so many respects, um, because when the ego is not satisfied, it starts comparing itself with others. And, you, so you, and you, that's always a bad idea. Because you either come up thinking, oh, I'm not as good as this other person, um, or my life is a failure, or you puff yourself up like a balloon, uh, and nothing is more right for a pinprick from life than a puffed up ego. And so mine's been exploded on a, on a number of occasions. Can I tell you a quick happy yeah. story about arrogance, yeah. uh, ego? So here's an example of my arrogance early on and how it got me into trouble. Um, and my very first job in television was a reporter in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And uh, I'd only been on the job for a couple of weeks. And the news director came to me and said, we'd like to consider you as a possible weekend anchor. I said, that'd be fantastic. And, and then I went on and said, yeah, I can do this. I'm sure I can do this. No problem. Well, there'd be a problem. So the two weeks later, I'm given the job and I'm uh, going to be producing and anchoring the weekend news. And on, on that particular weekend, there were, two main stories that we'd headline. One was a hard news story. Iraq was invading Iran. And then there was a feature story. The local zoo, the John Ball Park Zoo, was getting new penguins. So you have to kind of picture this in your mind's eye, but I'm starting the newscast, uh, teasing the main headline stories. And unfortunately, I reversed the order of the videos. So that when I said, when I said that the uh, Iraqi troops were marching into Iran, over my shoulder out popped the penguins jumping into their new pool at the John Paul Park Zoo. <laughs> and then, of course, two seconds later, when I said, oh, and the John Paul Park Zoo got new penguins and you should see them, here come the Iraqi soldiers charging into battle. So I was taken out to the proverbial woodshed and unceremoniously deflated my ego and the whole thing. So uh, I've had a number of those occasions where get rid of that <laughs> ego. You That's know, what's the, what's the lesson in terms of transitions in life? Less ego, more humor. That's hilarious. That is, that is funny. And a very good lesson to learn early on. That should have really cemented um, some yeah. good ego lessons for you right off Absol the bat. Absolutely. 
That's so awesome. Well, you know, we're all human, right? We all make mistakes and we have to be able to laugh at them. After after we're done being whipped in the proverbial web, uh, which That's right. That's right. <laughs> we are all human for sure. Um, so, you know, you're, you're as a photographer, you know, as a journalist, you're an artist and you are an artist um, in, in taking the pictures that you've taken around the world and in um, creating some beautiful art with that. So it's a whole other other piece to Jay Shadler that's um, really captivating. Mm -hmm. How does your art, the pictures that you take, reflect the way you see the world? I always have a hard time talking, Mary, about art. I mean, it, it's uh, just because it's so difficult to articulate in so many respects. But I would say that for me, art has been um, art has been a way to explore um, inside myself. And what I want, have discovered for me, I think every, every artist um, maybe finds a different part of their soul that attaches closely to their heart. What I have found is that my, the artwork that I produce seems to, me more, to, seems to be more optimistic, seems to have a happier spirit and cadence in his life than I feel. Uh, and that, that's always intrigues me. So the thing that's coming out as an expression of you, say your soul, uh, suggests to me that maybe there's something very positive and hopeful <laughs> in, in, deep inside here. Uh, I love I love taking pictures because uh, I can then ponder a scene. So much of life passes through very quickly, but if you can stop for one moment, it's like being in the present moment a great piece of photography, a great piece of art, absolutely brings you to the present moment. You can't be in the past, you can't be in the future. Um, just this afternoon, and it can be anybody, I and mean, this is true of professional artists and, and amateurs and all of us. You know, everybody's taking pictures of their cell phones and, and sending some spectacular things. Just today I got a picture from my from my uh, daughter uh, with our grandchild. And it was, uh, you know, grandchild was just walking along a little lake and she had her little boots on, a short summer skirt, and she was splashing water and her hands were behind her back, walking on, kicking, kicking the water. And I just said, well, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. So, so you don't have to be an artist to, to capture a moment. Uh, and, and that's always satisfying because like I say, then you are in the moment. I love that, being in the present. Mm. Tell me how, um, tell me who has been the most influential person in your life. Well, I'd say without a doubt, my grandfather. My grandfather was, um, was a, a launderer, uh, delivered laundry for, as a trade. Uh, but he did that largely because the hours were from four or five in the morning until like 11 o'clock in the morning because the rest of the day was his. And during those days, this is a man with an eighth grade education, during those hours, he self-taught himself. He self-taught um, everything about archeology. span He became an archeologist. Uh, he became a, a botanist. He, uh, he became a master gardener. And he taught me about astronomy. Uh, he made his own telescope. And I can remember the first time my, my brother and I looked through that lens out in his back garden on a summer evening, and I, I saw Jupiter with four of its satellites around it. Um, it just, it's a perspective that has remained with me all my life. And so he was somebody who made the decision that life was to be lived in this way, and it wasn't to be mandated. Uh, are controlled by money or anything else. Now, anyway, so he, he was always an inspiration, always an inspiration, always creative, always taking this, the, the different angle on things. I loved him. So much to learn from your grandfather. Yeah. That's wonderful. You know, you speak in your speaking platform about transitions. And, and, you, and you take lessons from the road and lessons from your own life. Why do you think transitions is such a, a subject that strikes a chord with people? 
Um, because they encapsulate, transitions encapsulate the contradictions in life. And life is full of contradictions. Um, you know, there's a great Latin expression, amor fati, uh, to love fate, to love one's fate, regardless of what it is. And the idea here is, in some respects, is to go ahead and accept uh, that most dire, dismal, regrettable moments, embarrassing moments in your life, right alongside the sublime and the beautiful ones. It's all mixed up. So I, I do think that the transitions really highlight how contradictions can be balanced out and allows you to see when you're in a dark place that lightness comes around the corner. And when you're in a light place, don't get too arrogant about it. Don't get too high in the uh, eye in the tree because you're going to come crashing down. That will come too, absolutely. So I, people have, uh, both young and old, have come up to me after my keynotes and talked uh, about the, re the sense of connection that they have because uh, the transition is something that we all go through and not well. You know, that's the thing. There's not a game plan for these things. And I, I, I often say that I don't come as a guy or a teacher in any respect. I'm a fellow traveler here uh, who's dealing with depression and anxieties, but just like you, whatever that's going on in your life. Um, but being a fellow traveler, though, there are guides and spirits along the way who can help us with these these, these muddled times, difficult times, and they are They're difficult times right now. Um, but I, has there ever been a, a time when things weren't difficult? I, 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 I don't think so. I know a little bit about history now. I mean, there were certainly places in our experience where things are going smoothly, um, but change will come. By whatever name, change will come. Um, I always like the, uh, the quote by the poet Wendell Berry, who says that maybe when we no longer know what to do in our lives, that's when our real work begins. Maybe when we no longer know which way to go, that's when the real journey begins. A, uh, a mind that's not baffled is unemployed, he says. I like that. Oh, one, la one, one last quote. I love the Persian mystic Rumi, and he's got that line about uh, the dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at your door, laughing, and invite them in. I think that's what we, we the best we can. We can try to do that, have that feeling as we accept the failures and the mistakes and the hard times in our lives. I think the one thing that you've been able to do, just kind of listening to you, hearing you talk, and knowing a little bit about, you know, the past, you know, decades of your work, you meet people. And as you say, you have your, your own things that you, of course, you're dealing with because you're human, but you meet people where they are mm -hmm. so that you can bring them to a better place. I hope so. I hope so. That's a great way to connect. You know, Maya Angelou's, uh, when, I, when I think of you, I think of her um, quote that says, um, you may forget what um, someone says, but, and, and again, I may be messing up the quote a little bit, but you, but you, but you will remember how it made you feel. And I think that all the stories that you've been able to tell in, in your life and still do and the lessons you're able to share, um, give us a sense of connectedness. And I think now more than ever, we need that connectedness. I feel, I feel very much that way as well. And I, if I can make one small small addition or a plug is that uh, if any of your viewers are interested in my my talk i'd love to chat with you I'd be i'm doing it both uh, in person and zoom so um either way maybe we can share something that would be great what's the social media or how can we um connect with you how can others connect with you in that way the best way is probably through the website, uh, jshadler.com. If you kind of work your way through it, uh, you get to the bottom, there's a contact page. You can always uh, email me through that. 
And uh, I'm also on Instagram and I, I do Facebook, uh, not tremendously, but certainly in the last, I, you earlier asked, has the pandemic changed anything? I have begun to do a little, little social media. And uh, so I'm, I'm available there too. Great, we'll find you there. And we'll just end with this, Jay. What matters most to you now? Th that you're happy with this, this uh, interview. I am very happy. I am very happy with this interview. Thank Good. you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Oh, what a joy. What a joy to have Jay. Um, you know, he really teaches us that moving forward is, is how we find ourselves. And, and that our purpose isn't necessarily where we think it is. It's, it's where we are going forward. The possibilities that await us from here. So, and thank Jay so much for being with us. And thank all of you for being with us. And people inspire. Until next time.